within uh, the central station, once all of this scientific package is deployed, the central station is uh, turned on so that it can start uh, sending information back. Some of the equipment is tossed away, of course. Now, at this point, they're going for the deep hole, I believe. This is the using the drill again to get a very deep sample up to eight or nine feet, depending on uh, how much resistance that drill needs. Uh, at that price, it shouldn't uh, reach too much, meet too much resistance. And this will be disassembled in uh, carryable links. Of, I think they're about uh, 18 inches long, and carried back to give the scientists on Earth a longer stratified sample of the moon's crust. And after this probably four to five hour bit of activity, they'll brush each other off, take some of what they've gathered back into the limb and uh, go for a, about a 16 hour rest period before uh, preparing for the second EVA. And late on Thursday night, they'll take that second EVA, which is composed of a lot of walking. Actually, they'll walk about uh, 4,500 feet, if they land where they hope to, uh, to the Cone Crater, which is believed to be perhaps uh, the oldest, to represent perhaps the oldest part of the moon. And in all, the route they take, going and coming back, uh, they walk something pretty close to two miles. They'll be taking samples along the way and uh, sort of their choice as to what they want to do along the way and uh, coming back. This we probably will not see on the television camera because they'll be out of range. They'll take a special sample from a trench, and uh, this is to tell scientists a bit more about the soil mechanics of the moon. They also take the routine core sample, mm -hmm. which a uh, hollow tube goes down into the crust. And you can see on both of their backpacks here this uh, canvas bag that they carried, a similar one on the last launch, which they brought pieces of the surveyor back in. Now they will bring samples back in that, and they each carry one. This condensed uh, version, of course, doesn't share, show all of the photographing that the two crews, crew members will be doing all along the way, but uh, much of it will be uh, documented to the extent that uh, the scientists back on Earth will know where, what came from, and uh, under what conditions it was taken off of the mountain. And then after uh, the second four, or perhaps as much as a five hour walk on the moon, they'll Settle down to get ready for the problem of coming back to Earth, Walter. But they can extend it to another hour, and everybody's betting that they'll take the other hour if uh, all the consumables are right, things are going well on the surface of the moon. Thank you, gentlemen out there. CBS News color coverage of the launch day of Apollo 13 will continue in a moment. And under reasonably clear skies, a high haze still, but no serious weather problems. We're waiting for the launch of Apollo 13 with some 21 minutes and 25 seconds left in the countdown before the launch, scheduled for 2.13 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We had some reference earlier today to the number 13 in this uh, flight. It is taking off at 2.13, it is Apollo 13, and they'll be the 13th and 14th and 15th men to go to the moon. Uh, so, uh, but none of them seem concerned at all about the numerology involved in the thing. Uh, the uh, launch, all the countdown is going well with Jack Swigert now in that little command module pilot seat instead of Ken Mattingly, who may be coming down with the measles. We're going to have a new voice of Apollo here for the launch phase uh, at the uh, Cape today. Uh, Chuck Hollinshead, uh, who has been a deputy to Jack King, is taking over the voice job today. Jack King uh, wanted to see one of these launches from outside. It's a temptation, I guess, for everybody who's locked in the control room uh, during, the, uh, during the launch. So Jack King is uh, out at the uh, press site uh, to see for the first time, uh, other than on television, the launch of an Apollo uh, spaceship, and we're going to be hearing from instead uh, Chuck Collinshead, who's been drilling long as the backup man to Jack King as the voice of uh, launch control. We ought to hear an announcement from him just about now. This is Apollo Saturn launch control, T minus 19 minutes, 59 seconds, and counting. 
Now at passing the 20 minute mark in our countdown and the spacecraft test supervisor has indicated that they're running just slightly ahead of that in their countdown. The command module pilot, Jack Schweikert, is now pressurizing the service module reaction control system. This is the system on the service module, which consists of four quadrants with four engines each. Each one of these develops 100 pounds of thrust. He's arming these systems by letting the hypergolic fuels, these are monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, flow down through the system down to the final valves. Hypergolic fuels ignite on contact, so once those final valves are open, they would ignite and the system would be activated. So I could also reading out the temperatures and pressures of that system. The countdown moving along well at this time, T minus 19 minutes, four seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. I've often wondered whether Jack King and Hans had have a book from which they're reading all of that information or it's all back there in their heads. I suspect a combination of both, but at any rate, they do terrific jobs. It really, it's a, an extraordinary performance that they put on in keeping us so uh, uh, so clearly uh, informed about every move that's going on out there at the launch pad. A lot of things that the average uh, viewer and even those of us here relaying it to uh, our viewers out there don't really need to know, but it's, uh, it's terribly fascinating information. They, uh, incidentally, speaking of viewers, uh, the, there's still a large crowd here for the launch of Apollo 13. There's some uh, 7,500 uh, invited guests, uh, or more than that, I guess. There are 11,500 invited guests from NASA. 7,000 are said to be at, uh, at the uh, VIP uh, viewing stand over on the causeway, a couple of miles from here. And here at the uh, VIP uh, site right here at Lunch Control, another 4,500 guests with the principal ones being uh, Vice President Agnew and uh, uh, Billy Brunt, uh, the West German leader who is on a visit to the States and has come down to watch this launch today. He has reason to be proud. So many of the important people in our American space program are from the a German rocket program who came here their own volition uh, immediately after the war, choosing the United States over Russia, knowing that their talents were going to be required by one of the two uh, conquering nations. There is the uh, press site, uh, which is right outside of our uh, CBS uh, uh, window here, and the VIP site is over on the other side of the vehicle assembly building, or perhaps uh, uh, 5,000 feet from us here. Bruce Morton at the Mann Spacecraft Center in Houston has a report on how the families of these astronauts are getting along. Bruce? Well, I am tempted to say this is another report from uh, Measles Central. I don't think we've ever talked about a children's disease this much on a space shot before. Marilyn Lennon is uh, over where you are. She's at the Cape with their four children one of whom, four-year-old Jeffrey, has come down with the real as opposed to the German measles, but uh, that apparently hasn't interfered with his going to see the launch. Mrs. Fred Hayes is here with their three children. Her sister's come to watch the launch with her. She, incidentally, is expecting their fourth child in June, about a month after her husband is due to get out of quarantine. Jack Swigert, of course, has no family, uh, one of the very few bachelor astronauts, uh, like Ken Mattingly, whom he replaced, he does have a lot of friends here. We talked uh, for a couple of minutes with the manager of the apartment building where Swigert lives. She uh, just couldn't find enough good things to say about him, uh, brave, courteous, kind, all the adjectives in the Boy Scout manual, and said her only regret was that this whole switch happened so late she couldn't get a party together to watch the launch. Walter? As a matter of fact, I understand that uh, Jack didn't even have time to get any of his friends down here to watch uh, this launch. Uh, he uh, was hoping that there is uh, father and mother, his father is an ophthalmologist, an eye doctor in Denver, that they could come down, but uh, apparently it was a little late for them to make it, and uh, so they're going to be watching the launch uh, from Denver. I'm uh, amazed to hear you say, Bruce, that uh, uh, one of the level of children, the one down here at the Cape, has come down with measles. Uh, I saw Maryland level last night. I have not had the measles, 
So I am assuming that uh, the command structure at uh, CBS will remove me from the uh, rest of this mission and turn it over to uh, my backup man, Wally Sharon. <laughs> I just contacted the measles I got. <laughs> well, you've got to go through a few immunity tests and things like that first, you know, too. Kick, kicking a lot of you around, I wonder if Jack King might just possibly have the measles and that's why he's not on the air today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I saw him outside, too, so we're all down. It's a, it's a problem, I guess. The uh, CBS News color coverage of the launch day of Apollo 13 will continue in a moment.